police police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 20, regarding the murder of a young woman on 99th Street, the sex unknown. That's all, Rose and Burke. conversation was overheard at a school crossing the other day. A young lady, age 10, was being escorted across the street by Officer Murphy. Howdy, Mary. Ah, you're all smiles this morning. Something special going on uh, at school today? Yes. She was going on a picnic up in the mountains on a Saturday and Sunday. Oh, that's right. Where about? Oh, oh Mark Wilson. We're going to see the sky through the great big telescope. Mm, that's oh. a pretty big uh, steep climb, Mary, for a little girl. Oh, we don't mind climbs anymore. Because bad news is your gasoline. <laughs> By your gasoline, Mary meant Rio Grande Crack. The official police gasoline. The fuel that powers more police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and motorcycles in Southern California and Arizona than all other brands combined. Again, Chief Jane D. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department, through whose cooperation these programs are broadcast, has a message for you. Be safe. Good evening. Unfortunately, the general public knows all too little about the stupendous task successfully achieved each day by the police of our large population centers, such as Los Angeles. The public learns through the press and by radio, off but a few of the intricate workings of a large body of men and women whose duty and responsibility it is to enforce the laws and protect our citizens against the loss or injury of persons and property. The dramatic and sensational witness, usually incident to criminal cases, naturally attracts a great deal of public attention. It is therefore fair and almost a necessity for all persons giving information concerning the work of our law enforcement agencies to stress the fact that cases given wide publicity constitutes but a small fraction of the work done by your police department. The story I have chosen for you tonight illustrates how necessary it is for our men to be trained and experienced, intuitive and alert in the investigation of crimes, particularly those where but few clues to the identity of the person committing them are available for the police to work upon. The crime we are to portray for you tonight was one of the most brutal and cold-blooded in the history of our local police work. The man that conceived it worked carefully and almost successfully in building up an unbeatable alibi. The man who actually committed the crime as a tool of the man who planned it was by circumstances far removed from any suspicion and might have evaded justice were it not for the intelligent manner in which the case was handled. <laughs> Dad, 
your dreams, Flora. Oh, heaven, look. What a good thing, man. Stop stupid, man. Oh, Mr. Cannon frantically called for the police. Shortly after the discovery of the body, Inspector Detective Davidson arrives at the scene of the crime. In here, Inspector. Nothing's been touched. Hmm. Buckshot wound, eh? Yes, sir. Fired point blank, apparently. Yes, looks that way. Well, here's the gun that did the work. Hmm. Double barreled, sawed off shotgun. One barrel exploded. Cool guy, whoever he was, leaving the gun there. Yes. He must have been pretty sure that he didn't leave any prints on it. However, take it in, Hickey, and have it examined for prints and get the photographer to come out here and take some pictures of the scene. Yes, sir. Who else was in the house at the time of the shooting? Uh, the sister and brother-in-law of the murdered woman. Where are they now? In the next room. Good. I want to talk to them. Good morning. I'm Inspector Davidson. Cameron's my name, Inspector, and this is my wife. How do you do? Oh, it's horrible. Oh, my poor sister. Poor oh, little nurse. <laughs> Mrs. Cameron, have you any idea who might have killed your sister? Find Emery, her husband. He's the only enemy Merle well had. Emery? Is that his last name? <laughs> no, his full name was Emery L. Where can we find him? I'll go with you, Inspector, and show you where he lives. <laughs> Emily L., his brother Alfred, and a friend of theirs named Ralph Moulton, found by the officers at L.'s house, are taken into custody. Brought into headquarters, Emily L. is questioned first. How old are you, L.? 26. What do you do? I'm a waiter. Where? At Hancock's All Night Restaurant. Uh, tell us exactly what you did yesterday from the time you got up until you went to bed. And speak slowly so the stenographer can get it. Well, that's easy. My day begins at 6 o'clock in the evening when I report for work at the restaurant. Yesterday, I got up late in the afternoon, stopped by my mother's house for a few minutes, then went to the restaurant. I wasn't out of the place until 6 o'clock this morning when I went home. Can you prove that? Sure. All you got to do is ask Harry Hancock. He's my boss. we will find him at the restaurant. From more indications, your wife was killed sometime after midnight. Are you sure you didn't leave the cafe at any time during the night? Of course I'm sure. Besides, why should I want to kill my wife? She's not my wife anyway. We're divorced. Well, I understand that you threatened her life on several occasions. Uh, that sounds like Herman Cannon talking. Well, it ain't so. Sure, we had a share of arguments. Like anybody else, that's all. I'll tell you, you got the wrong guy if you think I killed her. I can prove where I was all day and all night yesterday. And what more do you want? The truth. You had a possible motive for wanting her out of the way. It's true, isn't it, that you kidnapped the baby after the court gave your wife custody of him? Well, I took him to Arizona with me. Then he got sick and I brought him back to his mother. Listen, you guys are all wet on that score. I get to see my baby whenever I want to. You're barking up the wrong tree. I didn't have any motive for wanting to bump Merle off. All right, that's enough for now. Take him out, Sergeant, and bring in his brother. Yes, sir. We'll have to investigate that alibi of his. Right. Certainly is cool about the whole business. Yeah, and so is his brother. Did you hear that crack when we pinched him? No, what was it? Well, he asked me if the gun we found, and I told him it was being examined for fingerprints. And he laughed and said, well, that'll tell you who the murderer is. Hmm, they're both a little too cocky to suit me. <laughs> Sit down, Els. Now tell us. Where were you last night? Making my rounds. What do you mean, making your rounds? I'm a deputy counsel out in Maywood. I spent the night patrolling my district. Who do you think killed your sister-in-law? How should I know? Why did you laugh this morning when I told you that the shotgun was being examined for fingerprints? Did I laugh? I don't remember laughing. Well, no fingerprints were found in the gun. Is it possible you knew that the murderer wore gloves? I don't know anything about it. Take him back to his cell, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Call in Moulton. All right, Eddie. Bring in Moulton. Sit down. 
No, thanks. I'd rather stand. What's the matter? You're shaking like a leaf. Sam, I know, but this thing's got my ghost. You've been living with the elf boys, haven't you? Yes. Well, how come? Well, I've been out of work, so they let me stay in the garage and eat with them and return for doing odd jobs around the place. Where were you yesterday and last night? I rode around with Alfred in his car before he went to work. Bought some groceries and then went back to the house. I didn't leave again all evening. Did anything unusual happen during the evening? No. No. I sat up with Donald, Al's kid brother, till about 1 o'clock, listening to some hillbillies on the radio. Did anyone else come in? Not a soul. What do you know about this murder? Nothing. Honest to God, Inspector. I don't see what you're holding me for. I've got nothing to do with it at all. Well, how about Emery L? Did you ever hear him say he wished Murrow was dead? No, I never heard him say anything like that. I don't know anything about it at all. Okay, Moulton. Can I go now? No, we'll have to hold you a little while longer. Well, it won't do you any good, because I don't know anything about it. All right, take him back, Sergeant. Yes, sir. He's holding something back. Yeah, and he hasn't the guts to hold it back long. Either he did the job or he knows who did it. He'll crack before long. All he needs a little time. <laughs> Opinions of Detective Headquarters vary on the identity of the killer. Some feel that Emery L., ironclad alibi, substantiated by testimony of his employer, still can be broken, and Emery proven to be the slayer. Others feel that Alfred had, a, had had a, ample opportunity during the night to commit the crime, although a motive for Alfred seems to be lacking. In contrast to the cool self-assuredness of the Elves brothers, Bolton's nervousness and protestations of innocence lead others of the officers to consider him the killer. Scores of witnesses are questioned, and from their testimony is revealed that all those the explanations of the Elves brothers regarding their whereabouts on the fatal night seem to eliminate them as suspects. Nevertheless, Emory Elves had been heard to remark that he would hire somebody to kill his wife. Following this trenchant bit of information, the officers questioned another sister of the murdered woman. Yes, Inspector. Merle has told me several times that she feared Emery would kill her. Why? Had he threatened her life? Yes. Well, that is, I've heard him tell her that he'd get her sooner or later. And I've seen him strike her. Well, when was that? Well, last summer, Merle and I were running a hot dog stand down the beach. And one night, Emery came down there and told her he wanted to take a walk with him so that he could talk to her. I heard him say, come on, so I won't have to hurt you. Did she go? Yes. A little while later, she came running back crying. And she told me that he'd tried to push her over the palisade. Oh, she was awfully bruised from fighting him off. And then later in the evening, he came back and tried to drag her off in his car. Then we called the police. And they took him away. But why should Ailes want to kill his wife? Well, he wanted to get her out of the way because he knew too much about some of the jobs he pulled. What kind of jobs do you mean? He just jobs. You'd better tell us what you mean. Well, listen, Lieutenant. I don't want to get into any trouble. Just leave it at that. I don't know any more about Emory. And I don't want to. <laughs> flashlight is found in Alfred L.'s automobile. He admits ownership of it, but is unable to account for the blood spot. On the clothesline behind the L's house is found a pair of freshly laundered corduroy trousers, bearing dark stains that might be blood. Bolton admits that these are his, but claims the stains are a grease spot. That evening, another officer is added to the investigation when Detective J.T. Silkert, completing a previous assignment, joins his brother officers in an attempt to unravel the mystery. He interviews the three suspects, and as the others had done, decides to concentrate on Moulton. Now, look here, Moulton. You've admitted those trousers are yours. And that brands you as a murderer because the stains on those trousers are blood. No, no, you're crazy. I told you they're grease. Just grease spots from the last time I worked on Alfred's car. Moulton, you're lying. I swear I'm not. You know more about this case than you're telling us. No, I don't. 
Honestly, I don't. I don't know anything about it. Listen, Bolton, you'd better come clean because that's the only way you're going to save your own mess. I tell you, I've got nothing to confess. Look here, Bolton. Blood's thicker than water. And those elves boys will stick together. And you may find yourself in a hot spot before you get through with it. Those trousers are being analyzed right now. And we'll soon know whether you're telling the truth. I had nothing to do with the murder. But you do know who did it. No. No. No, I swear to God I don't. Is that the truth? Yes. Well, you know, I'm kind of glad that you're not the man that we're looking for. Uh, have a cigarette? Oh, thanks. She and I need one. Have a light? Smoke tastes good. Have you been out of work long, Moulton? Yeah, about six months. Pretty tough going these days, isn't it? And getting worse. Oh, I don't know. It could be a lot worse. Well, there don't seem to be no hope in sight. Well, there's no use being pessimistic about it. All things will come out all right. Maybe, but I doubt it. Moulton, who killed Merlin? I, I, I told you I don't know. Please don't scare me. I'm sorry. Say, you're as nervous as a politician. What do you think, Bolton? You figure the Hoover will lick the depression? Well, I don't see how. He hasn't done any good yet. It's bigger than he is. Well, he's got two years more in the White House, though. Yeah, but what this country needs is a Democratic administration. That'll fix things up. Uh, a Democratic administration? You're crazy. No, sir. I know what I'm talking about. Now, oh, listen. There's a Democrat in the White House. The Who Hoover? killed Merle Ells? Listen, Silkus, I told you I don't know anything about it. You do, Moulton. Now stop holding out on me. No. Maybe I do have my suspicions, but they wouldn't help you much. Anything would help. No, come on. Let's have it. Well, Emory traveled with some pretty tough guys. You, you might look some of them up. Now, who, for instance? Listen, I don't want to put the finger on anyone. You'd better talk, Moulton. Yeah, I don't even know the fellow's name. Yes, you do. Well, I don't know his first name. Well, what's his last name? His name's... Brown. What does he look like? He has sandy hair and a mustache. Where does he live? He hangs out at a coffee joint in Huntington Park. Anything else? That's all I know. And I'm still talking. And I don't know anything else about it. And Moulton refuses to talk anymore. Silkus reports the results of his interview to Inspector Davidson. Don't you suppose it's worth anything, Inspector? Well, it doesn't sound like much. Brown's a pretty common name. Yeah, I know it is, but I kind of like to like to run it down, though. I don't know how much it is good to do, do you looking for a sandy-haired man by the name of Brown. You'll probably find plenty of them in Huntington Park. You know, I'd like to take Moulton along with me and we'll check all the hotels and coffee joints. And then Moulton could identify him. That is, if there is such a guy. He's taking a long chance. Moulton might run for it. Why should he? I've treated him white. Why should he double-cross me? Oh, okay. If you want to accept the responsibility, do you know what it means if your prisoner gets away from you? Accepting the serious responsibility of escorting an unshackled prisoner... Silkus takes Moulton with him to Huntington Park. After hours of searching the restaurants and hotels of the suburban city with no success, they are climbing the stairway of a rooming house on Randolph Street. Hey, what's the matter with you? Come on. Oh, I'll wait downstairs for you. Why? Well, I think just the guy up there by the desk. I'll see you later. Don't you try to run out on me. I won't. I promise. Okay, now I want to get a look at him. I'm going to have a talk with the clerk. Is there a man named Brown living here? Why, uh, why, no. What does he look like? Oh, he's a middle-aged man. First name is Harry. Nope, nobody here with that name. Okay, thanks. You see him? The guy by the desk? Yeah. Well, I got a glimpse of him. He walked down the hall just as I came up the steps. Was it Brown? I don't know whether it was or not. It, it looked something like him from the back, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Moulton will say no more. Silkus takes him back to jail. But that night calls on him again in his cell. Now listen here, Moulton. I'm sick and tired of this beating around the bush. Was that brown or wasn't it? Well, it looked a lot like it. Was it or wasn't it? 
Yes, it was. So fine. That's what I've been waiting to hear. Now, wait a minute. I'm not saying he did it. Maybe he's as innocent as I am. Well, Chief, well, you were pretty suspicious of him before, and now you're laying off. What's the big idea? Well, all I know is that I overheard him and Emery talking one time, and this fellow Brown said he was a gunman, and that he knew how to handle a machine gun. And then later, Emery and I went down to the riverbed and tried out Emery's old 12-gauge shotgun. But mind you, I'm not saying he did it, though. Well, no, you're not, but we look into this guy, Brown, just the same. <laughs> past midnight, Silkus, accompanied by two Huntington Park patrolmen, returned to the rooming house on Randolph Street. They roused the clerk. Well, what do you want? I'm a police officer. What room is that guy in that I saw up here this morning? Why, uh, why he's over there. Second door to the left. Thanks. Better be careful. Knock first and tell him what he says. All right. Thanks. I'll do that. Come on, boys. Hey, man. A friend of Whitey. Let me in. Oh, just a minute till I get something on. Okay. All right, boys. I'll just hold it. Don't make a move, Brown. Have you got a cat around here? What? You mean a gun? No, I haven't any. Well, get your clothes on. You're coming with us. Hey, what is this? You're under arrest. Under arrest? What for? Suspicion of murder. <laughs> Unresisting, Brown accompanies the officers to headquarters. Questions, he talks freely, but on the subject of the murder, he is convincingly ignorant and claims that he has met the elder brothers only once. After two hours of questioning, the detectives are no further ahead than when they started. Then once more, Silkus visits Moulton in his cell. Are you awake, Moulton? Yeah. Did you get Brown? Yeah, he's in the office now. He thinks he only met those elder boys once. Now listen, Ralph. I want you to do something for me. Just tell me something, anything, that'll tie him up with those elder boys. Can you do it? Give me a cigarette. Here, take this whole pack here. Thanks. Look, remind me of the time he was over at the house and, and him and Emory were talking about holding up that theater in Huntington Park. Thanks, old man. That's all I need. Armed with this information, Silkus returns to Inspector Davidson's office. For ten minutes, he listens to the relentless grueling of Brown, and then... Oh, for God's sake, lay off of me, will you? Give me a break. You're driving me crazy. I tell you, I don't know a thing about Look me in the eye, Brown. Now, have you told all the lies that you can think of? Are you ready to tell the truth? Why, what do you mean? What about the time that you and Emory Ells were over at his house playing that Huntington Park Theater holdup, huh? No, no! Well, what about it? And what about the murder of Merle Ells? No, I... I... I did it. Give me a pencil. I'll write a confession. That isn't necessary, Brown. Just talk. The stenographer will take it down. Well, I killed Mel Ells, all right. And they hired me to do the job. You see, we talked about the deal for a long time. A couple of months, I guess. Then Emory told me finally the other night that I'd get two grand for the job. Well, he took me over to the house on 99th Street and showed me the layout. He pointed out the porch where the dame slept. When we were all set, Emily gave me the gun and a flashlight. And I stole a car and drove over there. I figured it'd be a lead pipe thing. So I sneaked up to the sleeping porch and looked in. There was a woman with a kid sleeping right beside her. See, I hadn't figured on them being so close together. And Emily had told me that he'd kill me if I hurt the kid. Boy... I didn't know what to do. Finally, I figured if I got the danger set up, I wouldn't hit the kid when I when I let her have it. So I flashed the light in her face and said, Merle, wake up. Emily had told me her name was Merle. Well, she opened her eyes kind of sleepy like and said, What's the matter? Oh, then I lost my nerve. 
<laughs> yeah, I didn't have the guts to, to shoot it. It was too easy. So I beat it back to the car and drove off. I guess I rode around for about, oh, half an hour trying to dope out whether I should do it or not. Then when I felt like I could go through with it, I went back. But I lost my nerve again. Gee, she looks so young and sweet. Like a little girl sleeping there. Well, I rode around some more. And I damn near made up my mind to bump myself off. I hated myself, called myself all sorts of names, and I drove like the devil, almost hoping I'd wreck the car and kill myself. And suddenly, something inside of me snapped. Everything went red and yellow behind my eyes. And I went back and let it happen. Oh, thank God I didn't hurt the kid. Did you get the $2,000 for the job? No. Emily double-crossed me. Just before the bump off, I told him I was broke, and he gave me 22 dimes. Six, I suppose. That's all I ever got. $2.20 for a human life. Cut rate murder, and it'll cost you your neck. A few moments later, Emory Elge is brought in to face the slayer, whose confession has entangled him in the mess of a hideous crime. As he enters the room and sees his hiring, not a flicker of recognition crosses his impassive face. Well, you've met this man before, I believe. Uh, uh, n- not that I know of. Well, you can't have forgotten this valuable friend who did you such an unusual service a few nights ago. I never saw him before. I, I don't know what you're talking about. No? Well, perhaps this statement Mr. Brown here has just made and signed will help make it clearer. Read it. I think it'll interest you. Why, the dirty double crossing. Well, Els, what do you say now? Nothing. He said it all. Are you willing to sign the statement that what Benjamin Brown has confessed here is true? I guess so. That's about the way it happened. Good. Here's the statement. Just sign your name here. There's one thing I'd like to know, Els. And you got enough on me as it is? Plenty. But I'm interested in the motive. Why did you want your wife out of the way? Because I wanted the custody of the kid. Not because of what she had on you? No, oh, she didn't have nothing on me. Oh, well, it won't be necessary to prove that. This confession will be enough to send you up. However, in spite of their signed confession, Ells pleads not guilty when brought to trial. And Brown pleads not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. Elge is quite first. His attorney jumps to his feet when Emory's confession is introduced into the record. Your Honor, I move that that statement be stricken from the record. Upon what grounds do you base your motion? My client was starved, kicked, and beaten over a period of four days in order to sweat that confession out of him. This is no document of truth. It is a scroll of torture. Are you prepared to prove your statement? I am, Your Honor. <laughs> Working fast to meet this unexpected move on the part of the defense, prosecutor Bonner Richardson subpoenas George White, a reporter for the City News Service. Now, Mr. White, will you tell the court the circumstances of your interview with the defendant? I interviewed Ells and Brown a few minutes after they had made their confessions to the detectives. Where did this interview take place? In Inspector Davidson's office. Mm-hmm. Well, what was the attitude of the prisoner? Both of them talked freely, voluntarily admitted to crime. Were there any marks of violence upon the defendant when you interviewed him? None whatever. Absolutely positive? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. White. Go with it. the newspaper reporter, Ells' confession was admitted to the record. And with the aid of the newspaper reporter, Ells' confession was admitted to the record, and on January the 8th, 1931, he was found guilty of first-degree murder by a jury which recommended life in prison. On January 12, 1931, he was sentenced to San Quentin for life. 
Brown, although he threw himself on the mercy of the court for the plea of guilty, received the death penalty on January 16, 1931. And on July 14th, that same year, he was hanged by the neck until dead. <laughs> Pacific Southwest. Nature is now most lavish with her beauty in Southern California and Arizona. Now is the time to enjoy your car. But be sure that your car is properly conditioned, properly fueled and lubricated. Why not rely on the proven performance of Rio Grande Crack with Tetra Echo, the official gasoline of police and fire departments? You'll enjoy those easy, flowing miles at a lower cost with Crack. Lubrication is very important now. Why not try Rio Grande Crack's companion product, Sinclair Opaline Motor Oil? While Sinclair Opaline Motor Oil costs no more than ordinary oils, it is of superior quality because it has been subjected to certain refining processes seldom used by other manufacturers. by Madeline Kelly from the files of the Los Angeles Police Department. This is Frederick Lindsley speaking for the Rio Grande Oil Company. This is the Bond Broadcasting System.